What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network, here for a reading of The Ethics of Money Production by Jörg Guido Holzmann, published by the Mises Institute. Thank you very much to both of them. Today, uh, in the chapter four on utilitarian considerations on the production of money, we have part five, Sticky Prices. In the past 80 years, the sticky prices argument has played an important role in monetary debates. According to this argument, the man manipulation of the money supply might be a suitable instrument to re-establish a lost equilibrium on certain markets, and most notably on the labor market. Suppose that powerful labor unions push up nominal wage rates in an industry to such an extent that entrepreneurs can no longer profitably employ a great part of the workforce at these wages. The result is mass unemployment. But if it were possible to substantially increase the money supply, then the selling prices of entrepreneurs might rise enough to allow for the reintegration of the unemployment worker into the division of labor. Now, the argument goes, under a gold and silver standard, this kind of policy is impossible for purely technical reasons because of the money supply is inflexible. Only a paper money provides the technical wherewithal to implement pro-employment policies. And thus, we have here a prima facie justification for suppressing the natural commodity monies and supporting paper monetary standards. The argument grew into, the, into prominence during the 1920s in Austria, Germany, and the United Kingdom and other countries. After World War II, it became something like a dogma of economic policy. But this does not alter the fact that that it is a sheer fallacy, and it's not even difficult to see the root of this fallacy. The argument, in fact, premises on the notion that monetary policymakers can constantly outsmart the labor unions. The managers and printing press can again and again surprise the labor union leaders through, a round, round, through another round of expansionary monetary policy. Clearly, this is a silly assumption. And in retrospect, it is very astonishing that reasonable men could ever have taken it seriously. The labor union were not fooled. Faced with the reality of expansionist monetary policy, they eventually increased their wages, their wage demand to compensate for declining purchasing power of money. The result was stagflation, high unemployment plus inflation, a phenomenon that is in the past 30 years has come to plague countries with strong labor unions such as France and Germany. Part 6. The Economics of Cheap Money Another widespread fallacy is the idea that paper money could help to decrease the interest rate and thus promoting economic growth. If new paper tickets are printed and the first offered on the credit market, so the argument goes, the supply of credit is increased and as a consequence, the price of credit, the interest, declines. Cheap money is now available for businessmen all over the country, and they will invest more than they otherwise would have, and therefore economic growth will be enhanced. There are actually a good number of different <laughs> fallacies involved in this argument, and it's impossible for us to deal with all of them here. Uh, for further details, see Mises in Human Action, especially Chapter 20, and Mary Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State, especially Chapter 11, and Jesus Huerta de Soto in Money, Banking, Credit, and Economic Cycles, and Chapters 4 to 6. Suffice it, suffice it to say that capitalists invest their funds only if they can expect to earn a return on their investment, interest, and that they do not seek merely nominal rates of return, but real returns. If they expect the purchasing power of the monetary unit, the PPM, to decline in the future, they will make investments only in exchange for a higher nominal rate of return. Thus, suppose Mr. Myers plans to lend a sum of 100 ounces of silver for one year to a businessman in the neighborhood, but only in exchange for a future payment of 103 ounces. Suppose further that the ex expected silver to lose some 5% of its purchasing power. Within the following year, then, Mr. Mayor will ask for another 5 ounces, making the total future payment 108 ounces, so as to compensate her for the loss of purchasing power. 
Now the question is whether one, printing new money, uh, tick, trigger, if, well, now the question is whether one, printing new money tickets will in fact decrease the real interest rate and two, whether it does decrease the real interest rate. Uh, this will be an economic boon. To answer the first question, we have to bring anticipation back into the picture. If the capitalists realize that the new paper notes are being printed, they can expect a decline of the purchasing power, and thus they will ask for a higher premium, a price premium. If the price premium is an exact compensation for the decline of the purchasing power, the real interest will be unaffected. In this case, the artificial increase of the money supply would entail merely a different distribution among capital of capital among businessmen, and thus a different array of consumer goods being produced. Some businessmen and their customers will win, whereas other businessmen and their customers will lose. But there will be no overall improvement. Now suppose that the capitalist overestimates the future decline of the purchasing power. In this case, the real interest rate would actually increase and many businessmen would be deprived of the credit they could otherwise have obtained. Again, a consequence would be the different distribution of capital among businessmen, and thus a different array of consumer goods being produced. But there would be no overall improvement or deterioration. Yet it is also possible that the capitalists underestimate the future decline of the purchasing power. This might be the case in particular when they are unaware of the fact that more paper notes are being printed. It is this scenario that the advocates of cheap money com commonly have in mind. But the hope of tricking capitalists into accepting lower real interest rates entails more economic growth is entirely unfounded. It is true that in the case under consideration, the real interest rate would decline under the impact of new paper money being offered on the credit market. It is also true that this event is likely to incite businessmen to borrow more money and to start more investment projects than they otherwise would have started. Yet it would be a grave error to infer that this is tantamount to enhanced economic growth. This case is exactly the reverse. At any point in time, the available supplies of factors of production put a limit to the number of investment projects that um, then they are then can be successfully completed. What the artificial decrease in the real interest rate does is to increase the number of projects that are being launched. But the total volume of investment that can be completed has not thereby increased because this volume depends exclusively on the productive resources that are objectively available during the, tier, during the time needed uh, for completion. The artificial decrease of the interest rate therefore lures the business community into all kinds of investment that cannot be completed. In terms of biblical example, they could, it could be said to start building all kinds of towers only to discover after a while that they just had the resources to build the foundations, but not to finish the tower themselves. And that's in Luke. The labor and capital invested in the foundations are then lost, not only for the investor, but for the entire commonwealth. They could have been fruitfully invested in all, a smaller number of projects, but the artificial decrease of the interest rate prevented this. In short, economic growth is diminished below the level it could otherwise have reached. To sum up, it is by no means sure that politically induced increase of the money supply will lead to a decrease of the interest rate below the level it would have otherwise reached in the free economy. The success of cheap money policy is especially unlikely when the policy is not adopted on an ad hoc basis, but turned into a guided principle of economic policy. But the fundamental objection to this policy is that it, is, that it is counterproductive even if it succeeds in decreasing the interest rate. The consequence would be more waste and thus less growth. Piers, thank you very much here for joining me in, in the reading of the chapter on sticky prices and the economics of cheap money of the ethics of money production by Jörg Holzmann, published by the Mises Institute.
Thank you very much for watching and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.